marketing V-Realize automation with Power VRA. Uh, some quick introductions because we've got a lot to get through. So I'm Jonathan, I'm a consultant at Extrovert and I'm one half of the Power VRA project. Um, I'm Craig, um, I'm the other half of the project, I'm also a consultant for Extrovert. So, uh, quick up front, this is, we don't work for VMware, this is not supported, so you can't call them up if you've got a problem with this. Um, we're using their REST API, so you can talk to them about that, but um, this is a community-based project, so just bear that in mind if you um, decide you want to use this uh, in your own environment. Um, so, first of all, uh, what is it? Um, anyone here actually using this toolkit from us yet? Great, a couple of people in the front. So, uh, Power VRA is a PowerShell module um, using the VRA REST API to automate elements of VRA itself. Um, if you've used Power CLI before, it's kind of the equivalent of that. So, where Power CLI is for vCenter, Power VRA is the equivalent kind of thing for VRA. Um, so, why have we made it? Well. Partly it didn't exist and we didn't see any plans from VMware to make one and we kind of wanted it and needed it for our day jobs so we just decided to make it ourselves. Um, also if you've worked with VRA yourself and tried to do um, large scale administration tasks through the GUI it's not always the most pleasant of experiences. Um, so we wanted a, a command line tool um, we're both big PowerShell users anyway, so we wanted that native experience like we've got in PowerShell, PowerCLI, but in VRA. So that's why we made it. Um, there are other tools available, so if you use Orchestrator, there's a plugin for VRA that gives you a lot of that functionality, um, which is great, particularly if you're developing automation within VRA itself. Um, but what we wanted really was that command line interactive experience for doing stuff. VMware do provide something called the cloud client. Anyone here use that? Okay, a few more hands. Um, so that's uh, a tool which is cross-platform. Um, command line interactive tool. It's got some good things, maybe some not such uh, good things. So that, that is available. Um, but we were really after the the native feel of a tool that we're used to in PowerShell. So we decided to have a go at making one ourselves. Cool. So what do you need? At the moment, um, we support uh, VRA 624, um, 70, 701. Um, and with module version 1.4, we'll be supporting 7.1 as well um, for uh, network profiles. Um, PowerShell 4 and upwards, um, PowerShell 5, We'll add support for the PowerShell gallery and install module, so it makes it easy to get and install the module. Um, so downloading is pretty simple. Um, if we was on install module Power VRA, and then it's done. Apart from that, if you don't have PowerShell 5, uh, you can use this one liner that we've got on our GitHub README, which basically will pull down the latest version from, from the repo. Or you can just do git clone. Um, and, and just grab the repo from there and import it manually. Okay, so before we get to the good stuff, just uh, a couple of quick upfrontness about some of the limitations. So if you've worked with VRA in its current state, it's still this kind of split brain product where some of the functionality is in a Linux-based appliance and some of it is still in an IaaS appliance that's based on Windows. More and more of that is gradually moving across into the VRA appliance, um, but we are only working with the v uh, VRA appliance. We made a decision to uh, just concentrate on that and wait for everything else to come over. Um, so what can we do? We can do anything that's in the VRA appliance, in Power VRA, potentially, um, and we've got quite good coverage of, of most of the common things you would want to do. Um, we can't do anything that's still in the IaaS API. So we can do things like create tenants, directory service, reservations, everything in the list at the top there. What we can't do still are things like fabric groups, machine prefixes, 
uh, moving a machine between reservations. You can do some of that stuff in the cloud client, so if you need to do that, you, you might still need to use that tool. Okay, so time for some, some of the, the more gritty stuff. We've got some examples coming up. Um, as a note, a couple of these examples uh, require version 1.4, which is going to be out either the end of this week or beginning of next week. Um, but we're going to start with request a catalog item, which is currently supported. Um, the next example will be requesting a basic catalog item, which you know where you don't have to pass any extra parameters. You just accept the defaults. So if you want that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we use first get VRA catalog item to find our catalog item that we want to request. And then all that you do is you get that catalog item and pipe it to request catalog item. With that, there is a wait switch which you can choose to wait for the, the request to complete. If you don't pass that, it will just return the request in its, in its sort of waiting state. If you do pass it, it will poll until request is successful then return. Uh, right. Yeah, one thing just to point out there is, is we've really wanted to get that um, PowerShell experience so as much as possible you can use the pipeline just like you would in uh, Power CLI or, or PowerShell itself or all of the functions where possible we've um, strived to add that functionality just to make it really easy to use particularly if you're already familiar with PowerShell. Cool. Uh, request and resource action. So people who use VRA are probably aware that once you deploy a resource, you can have a number of actions that are available based on an entitlement. What we can do um, with 1.4 is we can get a, a, the resource machine. We can look at the actions that are available. Should be the next one coming up. And from there, we can pick one. Uh, in this example, it's going to be a reboot. And then we can, again, pipe that through and request it. Um, it's important probably to note that some of them, especially reconfigure, you're going to have to work out the properties that you send down. Those of you that have worked with VRO already probably know that this isn't an easy task because you've got to find those properties and they're not always in the, the format that you would expect. Um, so the use case for this is, is going to be more the, you know, the basic um, this sort of resource action request like rebooting power on and um, stuff like that. But hopefully eventually we'll be able to build in the properties that you need for things like you know adding a network interface, um, reconfiguring disks, changing the description, those things that need the more complex tasks. Is that something you can push in as a JSON or Yeah, so with this there is a uh, you can pipe a, a JSON payload for it. Um, so if you can get the the request template from somewhere, you can grab that as, as JSON and just pipe that into the request. Um, there is a command in there that you can get the resource action request template, similar to the catalog item one. Um, I don't know whether you've looked, but for 90% of the stuff, it's there. For stuff that you actually want to do conveniently, it's not there. So it requires you to go and, and scratch your head and dig around and, and sort of watch the traffic. Um, it's that kind of that kind of things. But yeah, it's it's, it's possible to do that. Yeah, just to add, we have, as much as possible, we've been trying to focus on the user experience, maybe taking a leaf out of Joe's message from this morning, so not just making the tool for how we might want to use it, but so um, giving that interactive experience where you're typing out the commands, but also, uh, like Sam's saying, maybe you've already got the data and you just want to send it, hence the reason the pipeline support, so you can just chuck some data at these commands. Uh, and let them run. Uh, next ex example, use case. So uh, we see this quite a lot where we work, say for instance, um, we need to stand up dev and test environments for VRA, or someone wants to move their, their blueprints in between different environments. Since version seven, so this, doesn't, well, this is one of the things that doesn't work in six, um, because it's not in the API in 6, but it's there in 7. Uh, since version 7, you've been able to export your blueprints into YAML files, um, and that then consequently makes them easily documentable. You can store them in version control system. 
you can reproduce them quicker than clicking through 20 steps in a GUI, particularly if you've got uh, complicated ones. Um, so we're able to support that in Power VR8. So it's, I've just got a, a very simple blueprint here based off uh, one virtual machine connected to one network with some uh, memory values maximum one and two, two gig. Um, what you have to do is create a content package and then add all of the blueprints you want to export into a content package, which we're just doing here. I'm just grabbing the idea of one blueprint I want to add to a content package uh, and then creating that content package. And then the next step, we've got an export command, which will export that into a zip file on your system. You can then open up that zip file and inside there will be the YAML files for every blueprint, blueprint that you had uh, in that content package. Um, too small to see it there, but the YAML file describes the blueprint itself. So you can then take uh, that YAML file um, and do whatever you want with it. You can say you've got the same blueprint, but you need to offer five different versions of it, maybe with different resource values. You can just make co uh, five copies of that file, change the relevant uh, pieces, and then import it back. So what we're going to do uh, in the next one is import it back. So here, all I've done is change this, uh, the memory values from to two and four gig. Um, I'm going to, I've updated the zip file with that one extra YAML file, and then I'm just going to say import that zip file, and it will uh, import whatever was in there into VRA, and we're just going to flip back in here, hit a refresh, and there's that second template. Um, and just to prove it, we'll highlight there, go onto the machine resources tab, and it's got those different memory values. So just a, a simple example of, of how that can work, but you can imagine how powerful that could be. You can have documented the 50 blueprints that you need in your environment every time you maybe need to stand up a new one, or maybe you've got to document these, back them up in case anyone goes in there, screws it up, you can get it back easily. So um, that we found was quite a common uh, use case that we needed um, for what we were doing. It's the point that I'm actually just going to quickly mention. So Good. No, you carry on. In future versions, we're hoping to add um, support to the, the content package for, for actual bit different content that you can get. So at the moment, it's just blueprints. But in the future, it will be things like resources, um, yeah, software components, anything that's supported by the, the content the, uh, API, hopefully will be supported by that command. Um, so the next use case is probably one of the ones that I've, I've noticed be the most popular is that's um, resetting the, the password of a local user in, in VRA7. Um, we saw so many posts like this on the community's channel saying, like, we've got the configuration admin account or we've got an account and we don't know the password. How do we reset that? You know, um, the, the usual response is it's not supported in the, in the, uh, in the GUI. Go and use the API. Some people you know, might not want to use an API to just go and reset. So we have um, a, a set um, VRA user principle command. Um, one of the, the features of that is that you can reset the password of local users. Um, and also you can unlock them, um, which actually has been probably one of the most useful for me because I tend to lock my users out quite a lot. I'm a bit fat-fingered. So having that just to be able to go and unlock it with a single command has been, been pretty decent. So yeah. The, the example is really simple. Um, we've got test user at vSphere.local. Um, we've forgotten the password, and we can literally just go and specify a new password. And then the, the consequential login after that will be with the, with the new password. So we've had some quite good responses to that one where you've posted back in those uh, forums, haven't you? Because where somebody has tried to be helpful and said, uh, go and use the API to reset a password. Probably most people don't want to have to go and figure out how to do that. So we just point them in the direction of this and uh, 
they've been pretty appreciative, haven't they? Yeah, that's it. It's not always convenient to go and have to get a bearer token and fire up Postman or, or whatever sort of REST uh, client you're using, and then you know paste in the URI, paste in the bearer token, and then reset the password. So I, I mean, personally, I find it's it's easy just to do a get and a set, just like we would normally do in, in PowerShell for anything else. Okay, so how did we make it? Um, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about what we actually did to, to get the, the initial version of the, the module up and running. So we started on Bitbucket. Um, why? Uh, purely because uh, it offered private repos. Um, it's a nice feature that, that GitHub, um, they like to charge you for. So Bitbucket have that feature and it's free. So that, ables, that enabled us to get to version one um, without sort of exposing any of the, the messy development we might have had in, in the initial stages. Um, and, and this is just a, an example of the sort of the commits and the activity that we had in that, in that Bitbucket account, kind of between February and I think it was March the 21st when we actually released V1. Um, and you can kind of see that to get to a, a version one release, a kind of minimum viable product, it doesn't take that much time. And this was all of our sort of personal time, so for a couple of hours in the evenings and maybe at the weekends. Um, and, and within six or seven weeks, we had uh, version one, which we released then on GitHub, um, which seems to be a little bit more sort of um, widely used, I should say. So, uh, yeah, so we now have under the, the Jacku Labs um, team, we have the Power VRA repository, and that houses our releases, it houses our, our pull requests, any branches, any issues that you might have, this is where you'd come, submit them, um, and this is where the most active development is happening. Um, so module design. Um, creating uh, a PowerShell module around the REST API uh, is the first one I actually done personally, and I, I thought it was quite cool. Um, we, we had to make sure we had our core functions in place first, so connect and disconnect, they're the ones that would handle getting our bearer tokens and then deleting that session out of the out of the REST API. So one of the things before Disconnect came along, found that every connect you do, you, you, have, a, you have a session left on, on the VRA appliance. So Disconnect came to clear that up, so we made sure that it was clean. Um, within a lot of the core functions, you'll find invoke VRA REST method as well. Um, this is my favourite function out of the whole project because it enables me to do run a connect, I'll get my session um, information and then I can invoke any uh, URI uh, against the, the VRA REST API without having to, to paste bearer tokens everywhere and, and use Postman and stuff. So, you know, it's literally a, a, a case of doing invoke VRA, VRA REST method, passing the method that you want to specify in the URI and maybe some body content if, if that's the case. And then everything's returned back as a PowerShell object that you can then do exactly what you want with. Um, module layout, so we've now split into private and public functions. Um, those of you that have done PowerShell development, you'll know that the private functions aren't true private functions, but we segregate them because we want sort of a logical layout to sort of explain to users that these functions might not necessarily work as you expect if you run them on your own. So what we've got now is a functions folder and that's split into private and, and, and public. Um, for the public functions, we're moving towards splitting um, them by um, API service. So if you're aware of the way that the VRA API works, there's a number of services that have their own APIs. So within that, that public folder, we'll have different folders which organize groups of commands that, that share a similar endpoint. Um, uh, we are kind of at the start of that at the moment. Uh, another project that we're working on, we, we actually designed that approach and it worked really well. Um, so every function as well that you'll notice if you look at the Git repo, it's separated out into its own file. Um, I see both of this in the community, so you will often have people that have a, a, a rather large module file with a lot of functions in. Um, we decided we'd split it out, and, and that, for me, has made development a lot easier, organisation a lot easier, um, and, and troubleshooting as well, because you know where you've got to go. You don't have 4,000 lines of code, and you've got to find the module that you, know, you, need, to, you need to troubleshoot. Um, every function uh, that we develop, if possible, it should have get, set, new, and remove. So we're trying to keep that PowerShell experience kind of consistent. Um, with VRA, occasionally you don't have 
let's say a remove it'll be a set because you know that's the option that we have sometimes you have things like entitlements which you can't delete you just disable them um, pipeline support as Jonathan mentioned earlier on we want to be able to do get something set something as easy as that we don't want to be specifying annoying um, variables where we don't have to so that's consistency um, and also um, as well as pipeline support we ensure that again where possible uh, Parameters on, on commands, they should accept arrays as well. So you don't have to do get something, get something. So if I need to do get three things, I just pass name and the three things that I want to return and that will go and, and fetch that information for me. Um, finally, um, all of our development is test driven, for which we use PESTA. And I believe that's a good segue into the next yes. slide. Thank you, Craig. So. Uh, one of my learning goals for this year was to learn PESTA, which is a testing framework for PowerShell. Um, I kind of needed a project to be able to do that uh, with. So we decided um, once we had got part way into this that um, we would start testing what we were developing. Probably a good idea. Um, so we use uh, PESTA, which is an open source testing framework for PowerShell, and it enables you to write tests for your functions or for your scripts. Uh, in PowerShell code. So it's this framework you can use and you just write your tests uh, very readably. Here's one, might be a bit small, but basically you just, what we're doing, uh, typically we're doing the new get, set and remove lifecycle. Um, and what you do is you say uh, create a new thing and then the thing that was created does it, you can do a test like here, the name the name of that thing should be the name that was provided. And it's a way to test that what you are supposed to have created actually works. So um, we now have tests for all of the 80 plus functions in the, the, uh, the module. So this not only benefits us in being able to test what we've made, but also because uh, we've, at the minute we don't have unit tests, we only have integration tests. But that means when VMware comes out with a new release of VRA, we can, um, we've got 80 tests which we can run. It takes about 60 seconds to run all the tests. And then we can see, uh, are there any breaking changes with the new version? And in fact, we use this. We, we initially developed against version 7. And then we knew there were people like us who needed to use it with version 6. And we wanted a quick way. I didn't want to go through all. 80 functions, figuring out which ones worked. So we just ran the same test against a version six box and saw what broke, and then you know fixed a couple of things. Or for the others, we've made them tell you that this won't work with that that version. So it was a really uh, quick way to um, bring a bit more <laughs> production quality to what we were producing, given other people might might actually use this stuff. Uh, just one tip, if you do that yourself, uh, and something we're doing now is w whenever we develop a new function, we won't, um, we won't release it until there's a, um, a test to accompany it. So I'm quite annoying about this because Craig wants to release something new and I'm not letting him do it because he hasn't made the tests for it yet. Um, and it, but it applies to me as well. And, and that's partly because I had to write all the tests for all 80 functions. Um, and I can highly recommend, while it was interesting learning PESTA and doing the first few tests, once you've done a few, it's then just a copy-paste exercise pretty much for the rest of it. Um, and it was pretty boring. So I can recommend writing a test to accompany each function as you do it, and then it's uh, less tedious. Um, so issues and ongoing development. Uh, we are claiming we're agile, which really means um, we will try and fix things quickly if someone logs an issue on uh, GitHub. Um, this is just a summary of our, our release versions. So we do actually release quite often as well, which is an agile thing. So if we, even if we've just produced one new function, we'll do a, a new release. Um, so we brought it out in March down here. Um, you can see we fixed something the next day because something was broken in the initial release. Um, and then typically we've been putting out new functions maybe every month or so, the rest uh, during this year. 
And, and, and that works pretty well for us, really, doesn't it? We're, we're yeah. not like having to come out with like, yeah, we need to do these 20 things before we can put something else out there. You know, we've had a couple of people log issues for us, which is some of these minor releases, and you know, we've just put it out there the next day, um, and, it, and it does work quite well. Um, so, if you use it and you find issues or you think there's things we could be doing better, then please go on the GitHub site, log an issue, and um, we'll get Craig to fix it. Right, so automating new builds and continu continuous integration. This area is something that's excited me quite a lot, especially in the last few months. Um, so at the moment, we use a kind of a combination of community modules, and historically it was a case of when we were ready to release a new build, there, there would be a lot of manual steps updating the module manifest, um, updating documentation, ensuring that's, that's built correctly, you know, going through the code manually, looking at our syntaxes and making sure that everything's going to work. Where we move towards is, is combining a, a, you know, a group of tools to do that for us. Um, so we've got Saki, we use a PS Script Analyzer, Pester for Tests, most recently Platypus, which is, um, if you haven't got this module, get it, because it generates markdown help from your PowerShell help. It's really easy to use. Before I found out about that, I was doing it kind of with quite a big script. But now I just have a few commands that I can, you know, I've, I've outsourced that in a way to, to whoever's making this, this module. And it works a lot better than, than um, what I was using. Um, those M3, they're wrapped up by Saki. Saki is, if you've ever used Rake or Make, it's a similar experience. You're able to pass tasks to it. So if I wanted just to do an update documentation task, I'd do our build script and then specify the task parameter and then say update documentation. Same for bumping the version, um, same for updating the module manifest. Or I can just run it um, and that will run a full build which combines a number of tasks um, analyzing, updating documentation again, module manifest work. Um, again, uh, as well, uh, recently we've put in um, AppVayor support. Um, if you've ever used something like Tra Travis CI, it works in a similar way, but it seems more to be targeted towards Windows deployments. Every commit we make from now on our development branch um, will spin up a little instance of some sort of Windows OS in the cloud. Um, and it will run a PS Script Analyzer with some defined rules that we know and we've, we've set. And that will tell us, is that commit valid? Have we done anything that deviates from best practices set by Microsoft? Have we got any hidden syntax errors that we might not know? So for me, that's a big one because nobody's perfect. People make mistakes. Um, now I know because I get an email if I've made a, an error somewhere or if I've changed something that's affected something down the line. That they will tell me. Um, and I'm hoping to be able to grow this. At the moment, it's quite simple. It clones the Git repository, it runs our build script, um, and then from there, it runs the analyze task. Um, in the future, I want to start looking at things like maybe having a local Jenkins instance to handle tests against different API versions. So while we've automated the tests, the next layer up is ensuring that the tests are run against the, the different API versions. At the moment, we support. Uh, 6 and 7, 7, 1. Um, however, when 7, 2 is finally released, that'll be another version we have to, to test against. I don't want to be sitting there going, invoke pester, invoke pester, invoke pester. I want Jenkins to be able to go and run that and, and show me a nice radiator view of what's passed, what hasn't passed, why. Um, it's all about, for me, farming what used to be mundane tasks out to tools that can do it better than I can. Um, and, and, and these combination of tools are currently working for us. Um, on the subject of tools, um, this is small, I know, um, but this is a list of tools that we currently use to make our life easier when developing. Um, I've also released uh, a blog post with this on it today um, on my blog, so if you don't know the URL, um, come and see me after this, I'm happy to share it with you. But um, go back one. Oh, sorry. Um, just a quick summary over this. We both started using Visual Studio Code which is a free IDE provided by Microsoft, and, and it's fantastic. Um, we use this in, in conjunction with the ISC provider, and I think they both work really well. They both provide the same experience, but they offer slightly different things underneath. Um, off that, I'm not going to go into too much details about everything, but 
there's two, if you're looking at sort of source control and release cycles, the two links at the bottom, uh, the Git branching model and semantic versioning um, sort of uh, RFC, they're really useful. Um, that site for Git branching is quite old, however, it's still very relevant. And I find myself going back to this when I need to apply a hotfix and I need to visually see how it should work from my, from my master branch and how it should go down to any, any feature branches that we may have. Um, semantic versioning, as you've seen in the previous slides, is how we version. This website contains the specification on how you would do that in your own project. Um, so yeah, what are you waiting for? Um, we really need you guys to use it where you can. Um, give us feedback, any new things that you want to see, things that you know, we haven't put in or we may have done that, you know, that doesn't exactly align with the way that you guys do things. We want to know about it. Um, we need you guys to also spit, su submit pull requests. So if you find a mistake, log an issue. If you can fix it, fix it. Log a pull request and, and we'll merge. Um, we have actually done that already, haven't we? Yeah, we've yeah. had a couple, which has been it's quite cool to see something in your inbox and someone, someone's made a, a suggestion or a fix something you've done and we're able just to now run our, run our tests and, and sort of um, analytics on it and then just let it, let it go, let it merge in. Um, and then finally, anyone wishing to expand the testing with Pesta, let us know. Yeah, so I may have missold that as being boring. It's actually really interesting. It is fantastic. So <laughs> it's really good. If you would <coughs> like to help us with that, that would be great because it's really <laughs> interesting. Yes. So at the minute, no, I did some initial testing and because of, we, we also support um, VRA with self-signed certificates or full certificates and the way we're doing that uses some code from the full.net framework. Um, so currently, no, there was also some issues around you know, invoke VRA REST method, however, um, it is something I, I think definitely will be on the roadmap for this. Um, personally, going forward, uh, my, any modules I'm making now, I will probably start out with PowerShell Core, just where that generally is heading. It, it seems to be the best place to um, be starting that. So, yeah, what we do, <laughs> we know that a lot of people that work with VMware products are working on Macs. Um, so hopefully we can bring that support at some stage. Um, we're kind of blocked at the minute with two issues in the, there are actually uh, issues in the PowerShell um, open source project, they're, they're logged, so we're waiting for someone to fix those and then I might revisit looking at it again. Cool, yeah, so we also made Power VRO, so if you're interested in that module, take a picture of the link and go and visit the repo. Um, provides the same user experience, but for the Realize Orchestrator. So with that, we can do things like importing, exporting packages, resource elements, configuration um, elements, running workflows, viewing workflows, anything that's in the API is possible. Um, again, if, if you visit that repo and you've got suggestions. If they this, invite us back, we can talk about that next time. Yeah, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll bore you with our VRO next time. Uh, Cool. Thanks so very much. much.